Welcome back to Chapter 2, Part 2. In this short lesson, the main ideas I want to go over with you include the action potential, the resting potential, the all or none law, neurotransmitters, and the spinal cord. Let's get right to it. I've talked a lot about informational messages being sent from neuron to neuron. But what's the language of this message? It was discovered over 200 years ago. Luigi Galvani was an Italian doctor and scientist in the 1700s. He dissected animals to learn more about anatomy. Now one night, so the story goes, he was working on a dead frog and accidentally touched a motor neuron in the frog's leg. With a weak electrical current, the leg kicked out as if it was alive. He repeated this. He communicated with his scientist friends about his findings. Galvani concluded that there must be an electrical basis to life. Now other people, intelligent enough and well-meaning, not so much Galvani, speculated about reanimation experiments to bring the dead back to life. Maybe we could dig up human corpses, even going into the graves, take body parts and assemble a Superman. The challenge would be to harness enough electricity to stimulate life and it'd probably have to come from a severe electrical thunderstorm. All of this inspired Mary Shelley to write one of the great gothic novels of all time which you and I know as Frankenstein. You see the story of Frankenstein and his monster is based on early brain research. While the brain does emit a weak electrical current, think back to the EEG, we know today that it's electrochemically based. Well, let's explore this electrochemical impulse. It comes in two parts, the resting potential and the action potential. The resting potential is the electrical chemical state before firing. There's more negative ions inside, resulting in a slightly negative charge of a few millivolts. When a neuron becomes excited, it allows positive ions to flow into the cell membrane, and it becomes positively charged. This happens in one thousandth of a second, and it's called the action potential. The action potential is the electrical chemical change during firing. Positive ions flow out quickly and the resting potential state is restored in a thousandth of a second. This happens hundreds of times a second, the resting potential going to the action potential back to the resting potential, and a complex chemistry is involved but that's really beyond the, beyond the scope of our class. When a neuron fires along its axon, it fires or it does not fire. Think of it this way, it's a lot like pressing the trigger of a gun. You can press down harder on the trigger, but you'll not get a stronger response. This is called the all or none law. The neuron fires completely or it doesn't fire at all. A neuron fires hundreds of times a second but it fires at one intensity only. Now you might be thinking if this is the case, how does the brain know the difference between an ordinary message and an urgent or an emergency message? Well the nervous system can do one of two things. To begin with, more neurons in the area can fire. Although each neuron is still firing at full strength, Collectively, there's more power and urgency to the message. The second thing is that neurons can fire faster. Neurons have an insulative myelin sheath that enable this, and it provides a turbo boost in speed. Neurons normally fire, well, maybe two or three miles an hour, um, about the pace of me here walking on a treadmill. But, if an axon coated with myelin 
can ramp up to over 200 miles an hour rivaling this Indianapolis race car. When the neural impulse reaches the end of an axon, chemicals are released into the synapse called neurotransmitters. Researchers have identified dozens and dozens of these, and each neurotransmitter is correlated with specific behaviors and mental processes. Hopefully, when the neurotransmitter is released into the synapse, it swims across the other side and latches on to sites on the dendrites of a receiving neuron called receptors. I want you to think of a lock and key analogy here. Keys come in all different sizes and shapes, don't they? But they can only fit into the locks they were designed for. Well, the same thing roughly happens with neurotransmitters and receptors. When a neurotransmitter is released into a synapse, it hunts for the best receptor it can fit into. It may bounce around several times, like in a game of pinball. And because there's so many other transmitters in the synapse, it can look like a pool crowded with, symbol, with, with swimmers. This may be a good uh, visual image for you. I want to focus briefly on just a couple of neurotransmitters in the lesson, acetylcholine and dopamine. They're all very important, but we just have time to look at these two. We know that acetylcholine facilitates voluntary movement. It stimulates learning and memory. And it's involved in sleep and dreaming. We know that dopamine is associated with pleasure, and neuroscientists have nicknamed it the feel-good juice in the nervous system. Now we're going to get closer to the brain and nervous systems. There are several nervous systems to consider, but I want to spend the rest of this lesson and our next lessons on the central nervous system, which consists of the brain and the spinal cord. Just a little bit about the spinal cord. It's very much involved in reflexes and can function all on its own without even involving the brain. For example, when you stub your toe, a sensory neuron takes a pain message up to the spinal cord and then a motor neuron loops back down and sends a reflex to withdraw your foot without any conscious thought. It, it just bypasses the brain altogether. Well, that ends this short part two and part three and part four we talk about the brain the main event of chapter two i'll see you there so long